Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Lab 4, uh, Intro to Telemedicine Lab. This is a little bit of an unusual recording in that I'm actually recording this at the airport so on a layover on my way to uh, my military duty in Kansas. So uh, I really wanted to get this into your hands so you had ample time to review it before we began the lab together next week. Um, next week uh, is really just your opportunity to get paired up and do some practicing uh, with a partner in a breakout room to get yourselves ready for the uh, lab five, which is a, a no kidding telemedicine encounter where you'll go through the whole process. So I wanted to get this into your hands so you had an opportunity to really um, kind of digest it before we all came together. What the world used to be before COVID is, is we used to be able to interact with our patients. We used to be able to see their facial expressions and smile. Um, be, be, we be, were able to teach you in a manner in which there was significant uh, dialogue and exchange. And, and that has obviously changed. And now we're in a world where not only are we constantly having to social distance and we're placed in cohorts, but we're also segregated and we have barriers in place and we're coming up with new technologies on how we can deliver care in a remote fashion such that it's safe um, while still efficacious for our patients. And that's the challenge, right? Is, is making sure that we can do it in a way that makes sense for our patients. Now, are we surprised by all this? Um, you know, we really shouldn't be. Um, you know, an AOA survey completed in June of 2020 indicated that about 45% of all ODs were engaging in some sort of telemedicine at one level or another. And according to an August 2020 article in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, there's been a 700% increase in the delivery of telehealth services. So should we be surprised? Well, this was a headline in primary care optometry news. Telemedicine is predicted to play a larger role in optometry's future. Um, this was a headline in June of 2006. Fully 15 years ago now, um, they had predicted that telemedicine was gonna play a larger role. And, and to be quite honest, y'all, um, we knew it was coming and we knew that, that we needed to be positioned as uh, such, but sometimes it, it takes just a kick in the pants to get us moving. And, and really COVID was just that kick in the pants. We knew it was gonna be coming, uh, but as soon as COVID hit us, it accelerated the change um, at an exponential rate. So here we are today. Now, who is, who is leveraging or who is utilizing our um, telehealth services? Well, we all know that, that the younger uh, crowds, the younger patients uh, tend to do better with technology, leverage it more frequently. And indeed, that's what the demographics here from the health consuming, uh, health consuming group is Amwell is presented. Interestingly, however, the fastest growing segment of that population mirrors uh, very similarly uh, what we see with social, uh, the usage of social media, and that is that the age group of 50 plus is growing faster than any other of our age groups. And in many ways, we are really, um, we're feeling that crushing burden as healthcare providers. While we felt like we were, we were prepared in many ways, um, what we've actually found is that we were woefully unprepared. Um, there's definitely a struggle. It's very real as we've adapted to this and especially the 700% the increase in demand for our services. You know, a lot of this, because of the way it has changed and the way it's come on, it's created a sense of this is the, this is the Wild West. Like, we really don't know what to expect. We really, we are, we're defining terms, we're defining uh, CPT codes or procedure codes. We're defining new ways of doing business. And things just as simple as, as terminology. Is it telehealth or is it telemedicine? Is it teleoptometry? What exactly is it that we are doing today? Well, there's challenges, of course, that come along with that as we're defining um, all of these things. And, and the challenges that come our way include things like the interference with the doctor-patient relationship, right? There's nothing like sitting in the room with your patient and having that exchange and sharing those details and reading their facial expressions, 
right? There's nothing that can replace that. Uh, and when you introduce the layer of complexity of a, a virtual environment, that makes it even more challenging for us. The patient's ability to manipulate the technology is a limiting factor. It's a challenge. Um, their understanding of how the technology works, the legal responsibilities. If we talk about from just from our perspective, you guys, on how this impacts us, you're still going to be held to the same legal standard, the same malpractice standard as if you saw that patient in your office. So what's your, uh, what's your level of comfort with that? Yeah, and, then, then, and then there's consent. You know, we have to have the patient consent uh, to um, uh, a telehealth uh, encounter, a telemedicine visit. Um, if they don't want to consent, we can't provide that encounter. Uh, and then there's billing requirements, right? And we're going to discuss the billing and, and how you have to be somewhat cognizant of that in order to uh, avoid recoupment of payments later on. And then, of course, documentation. There's, there's multiple layers of documentation. There's new facets that we have to, we have to keep uh, abreast of in order to not get penalized for uh, not, for not uh, documenting correctly. And here's a pro tip, by the way. Uh, there's, there's a couple. Uh, number one, though, is make, make sure that your liability insurance carrier actually covers the delivery of telemedicine services. There are some, med there are some medical malpractice carriers uh, that won't cover telemedicine services. So when you're getting out and you're deciding which insurance company to go with to provide your malpractice insurance, I would absolutely ensure that they specifically cover telemedicine encounters. Here's another caveat, another pro tip, I didn't list it on here, but that is you, most states require you to be licensed in the same state as where the patient is at the time you are delivering the telemedicine service. So what I mean by that is if I am licensed in Oregon and I see a patient in Oregon typically, but the patient is on vacation in Sun River, Idaho, and they call me, I cannot, unless I'm licensed in Idaho, I cannot legally provide or render a telemedicine encounter to that patient in Idaho. Think about that for a moment, okay? Think about that for a moment. So there's layers of complexity here that present challenges we never in a million years fathom. Well, what about some of the other challenges we've got? We've got things like communications platform, what's approved, what's not approved, assessment methods. How do we even know how to assess a patient on a telehealth visit, uh, a telemedicine encounter? Uh, connectivity. You know, if you've got somebody that's on huge satellite out in Eastern Oregon and the connectivity is very low, you may not necessarily be able to render that telemedicine encounter. <coughs> quality of software. Um, oftentimes patients have um, older computers. They may not have a webcam. Um, and if, if we don't have that, then we have to roll down uh, to the next layer or the next level down of service that we can provide, which instead of being a, a video encounter and maybe a telephonic encounter only. So we could be limited by the quality of hardware. But let's talk about platforms. So let's, let's kind of get into this and let's talk about some of the things we do have available, all right? Um, so platforms, we've got things like Zoom. We're all familiar with Zoom and Zoom has a HIPAA compliance feature now. Skype is approved. Uh, Teams, Microsoft Teams platform is approved. Doxy.me is also a platform that could be used. And then we get into some other platforms that begin to um, really go from just you and the patient to a third party vendor um, that you could contract with either on a monthly basis or an annual basis to uh, assist in the rendering of your telemedicine care. Um, sorry. Then you have uh, companies like iCare Live. iCare Live is one in which um, the, the patient is able to uh, create an account, sign in, they can check their quality of eyesight if they want to have a digital or a, a telemedicine encounter uh, with one of their licensed eye care providers. They can set that up and establish that. Um, and so you can use that as a, as a practitioner. You can use that as a form of coverage. If you happen to be out on vacation or, or something else, you could contract with companies like eye care Live or UpDocs or 2020 Now to deliver that service. Now, I'm going to change it just a little bit because I Care Live is, is truly a virtual, uh, Amwell and, and I Care Live are truly virtual entities. 
Um, but then we get into things like Opdocs 2020 now, digital optometrics. And these particular companies offer what's called remote telemedicine services. And that is, they have a, a no kidding license provider offsite. Um, the patient goes to a brick and mortar facility uh, and interacts with um, a certified ophthalmic technician, a front desk staff, a remote certified ophthalmic technician that does the refraction for them, um, and then an on-site certified ophthalmic technician that does the slit lamp and any imaging that needs to be done in the visual field and eye care, those sorts of things. That information is then uh, reviewed by your uh, remote clinician, okay, who then visits with the patient shares with them the findings and provides them that prescription. So we have a, a really a wide range of services that are available to our patients, some of which we control and it's very intimate. It's between you and your patient, i.e. Zoom, Skype, Teams, Doxy.me. Those are ways in which you interact with your patient. And then we get into the ones where it's a, a virtual encounter offsite, no brick and mortar like Amwell or I Care Live. Then we get into the other ones where you have a remote delivery of those services. Interestingly enough, the digital optometrics um, is currently serving quote unquote customers in the following states and they have, um, uh, they will be opening up in uh, these other states in the not too distant future. I will also share with you from uh, a uh, legislative perspective, um, having come from Kansas, uh, we had a very strong corporate practice act. Uh, that would preclude an arrangement like this because those, in the, those encounters would need to be conducted in a doctor-owned practice, um, not an entity owned by anything other than an optometrist. So depending on the state and the corporate practice acts in those states or provinces, if you're from Canada, you may see Digital Optometrics 2020 now. You may see these types of entities coming in and setting up shop in your area. So limitations to a telemedicine visit. Now, folks, when I talk about the limitations here, I'm really, these are specific to, sorry, these are specific to um, virtual at-home visits. Um, all of these things are deliverables. These are all deliverables if we're talking about a remote uh, telemedicine visit in which the person goes to a brick and mortar facility with the optometrist offsite. So these are specific to, um, to encounters where the patient is at a remote location and the doctor is also at a remote location. Uh, the, number one, obviously there's no detailed view of the anterior posterior segment. There's certain things that you can see of the anterior segment, but you just simply can't with the technology we have today. You cannot see the posterior segment. You can't get an IOP measure unless the patient is doing a telemetry and they have the eye care home device, there's no IOP measure that you can acquire remotely. The refraction isn't possible. Tech, uh, patient technical abilities or skill sets, their ability to manipulate the technology you need them to use is gonna be a limiting factor. And then the patient report and measures can be questionable at best. And when we do our telemedicine encounter in lab, Four and lab five, in lab four, where you're practicing and just getting accustomed to the eye handbook, and then in lab five, where you actually deliver the telemedicine encounter, you will find that those measures are are um, they are they are they are best estimates is is the best way I can I can describe that. Um, so terms matter, right? Words matter here. So words words matter. And uh, when we talk about um, telehealth or telemedicine, I think it's important to understand the differences between the two because these terms get used interchangeably and erroneously so. Um, when we talk about, sorry, everybody, let me, get, let me get us back to where we are. All right, I think we're all back here. Um, I'm hoping I'm still sharing my screen with you. Let's see. Okay, good. We're all <laughs> we're all on the same page. Uh, I, I again, I apologize. I am not the most tech savvy, and for me to be delivering a telehealth slash telemedicine intro lecture is incredibly ironic. So, 
bear with me. Um, so when we talk about telemedicine or telehealth, um, the terms matter, and those two get used interchangeably. So what's the difference between those two? So when you talk about telehealth, that's broad in scope. It refers to both the clinical and non-clinical care of a patient, okay? Telemedicine, on the other hand, is more narrow in scope. And with that, what we find is it really refers to just clinical services. Now, according to the Office of National Coordinator uh, for Health Information Technology, telehealth can include things such as administrative meetings, education, continuing medical education, that sort of thing. Whereas telemedicine is specifically limited to the delivery of remote clinical services. So telehealth is significantly more broad than telemedicine, which is very narrow and focused on the, the rendering of clinical care to a patient. Uh, and what about teleoptometry? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, that is a make-believe term. Uh, nowhere is there a CPT that covers teleoptometry. Nowhere um, is it defined in or codified in national policy. So we are limited to telehealth in the broad sense and telemedicine in the very narrow sense. And within telemedicine, optometry is a component part of that. So what are types of telemedicine? Now, we've got a couple of different broad categories. The first broad category is what we call asynchronous. And the second broad category is what we call synchronous. Um, and under the synchronous piece, you've got supportive, consultative, remote monitoring, comprehensive uh, care with a remote provider, and then finally virtual at-home visits or VAHOV. Okay? So let's talk about each one of these in turn. So asynchronous is really what we would consider to be a, a store and forward concept. In essence, it would be where the technician acquires the image at a remote location, and then you log in and review it at a future date. Now, the key here is once you've logged in and reviewed that information, and you've provided your interpretation and report of that image, you then provide a report back to either the referring clinician, if the patient was sent to you, or you provide a report back to the patient. The key is you have to have some sort of follow-up contact with the patient when you are completely done. So asynchronous, again, completely done by your uh, technician or your staff, and you then review those images at a later date. I would call this a store and forward concept. Now, when we talk about our other types of telemedicine encounters, these are gonna be what I call synchronous visits, and these can be conducted either via video or phone. And we have some uh, categories here, supportive, uh, supportive telemedicine or telehealth, uh, as it were, um, in the broad sense, telemedicine in the very narrow clinical care sense. Supportive telemedicine is any remote service that is provided in support of an in-person visit. And this is a tough one to wrap your brain around, but if you think about it, it becomes pretty easy. A supportive service would be you emailing out uh, an intake form to your practice, uh, you mailing out any welcome to the office forms you need the patient to fill out before they come in. Those would be, those would be um, types of supportive services or so types of supportive telemedicine. And then we've got uh, consultative. Now, consultative are when you dial in someone to your exam room. For example, if you have something in your chair at that time and uh, you need a consult. So for example, if I'm looking at a corneal lesion and I, you know, I'm looking at that darn thing and that looks like acanth amoeba. And I want my corneal specialist to take a peek at it with me um, so that I can get the patient started on the correct treatment as soon as possible. And I dial in that, uh, that provider um, via Zoom, that would be a consultative that will be a consultative medicine visit. And your, your corneal specialist can bill for that, okay? And then we've got something called remote monitoring. Remote monitoring is where we go um, and have the patient monitor their own condition at home. And then monthly, we, we will dial in and we will review the telemetry um, or the recorded findings. And, and some examples of this are gonna be the eye care home, which we have our patient here checking her eye pressures with the eye care home. Um, and then we have 
the uh, it's essentially the per, uh, uh, peripheral hyperacuity perimetry um, where the patient would use this particular instrument to evaluate um, for or, or monitor for the uh, um, uh, formation of wet AMD or neovascular membrane or net. So there are types of tests that the patient can be doing at home, record those findings, and then you are able to retrieve those uh, typically on a monthly basis and review those. Again, that is a type of uh, remote monitoring, is a type of synchronous telemedicine, as that synchron uh, synchronicity is due to the fact that the patient is recording it in real time. And then we get into the uh, comprehensive eye exams with the remote provider, and that's the one with the brick and mortar, like the 2020 now in the, uh, uh, the optometrics, digital optometrics, um, where the patient goes to a brick and mortar, everything is run by the technician, and then the remotely, uh, the remotely located doctor reviews all that information with the patient at the end of the encounter and provides the script. Now, where we'll spend most of our time today, we'll touch on the comprehensive uh, re with the remote provider, but where we'll spend most of our time today is the virtual at-home visit. And this is the one that you are actually going to be doing uh, this week with your partner, and then you'll be doing for lab five um, in real time. Now, there are three nodes. Let's, let's go ahead and we'll kick it off with uh, the uh, comprehensive with the remote provider. So the comprehensive with the remote provider really has three nodes. You have the exam site, which is the brick and mortar. And at the exam site, it typically is going to be an optical, okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent, it typically is an optical that is then staffed with certified ophthalmic technicians that are in the back running the instruments, taking the photographs, running the fields, setting up the four opter, and a remotely located, uh, <clears throat> a remotely located cer certified ophthalmic technician that does the refraction via a digital refractometer. And then you have a front desk staff there as well. The technician, um, the, the exam site, the tech site, which is gonna be your certified ophthalmic technician, who's also offsite in running the refraction. And then you have the provider. So you have those three nodes and the provider is either at a satellite office at, um, at a different office location, or they could be at home. Now the 2020 now model, uh, the way they do it is um, obviously for a monthly fee, uh, you can uh, contract with them and they will quote unquote staff one of your satellite offices for you where they supply the technicians that can run the instruments and the uh, technician that can do the prescription uh, determination for you. And then all you have to do is okay it or finalize it, or they can even provide you with the optometrist that will finalize that prescription for you. And of course they will charge you a, a, a fee for all of those services, but some doctors find that to be lucrative in that they, um, aren't they don't have the exposure or the uh, expenses that they would if they were them they were there themselves? So they will do this for sites who who aren't quite as busy as their main location. So exam site, tech site, and provider site are the three nodes in the uh, exam room on these at these remote uh, these comprehensive exams that have these remote providers in the exam room. It's it's typically a very well-equipped uh, lane. They'll have an eye care, auto refractor, auto care counter, digital four opter that can be run remotely, a slit lamp with a camera, vid a visual field analyzer. They typically have wide field fundus photography um, and they perform non-dilated exams. So these sites uh, don't do dilation. So these are all gonna be undilated exams. And that's something that the, um, that as a, as a provider, you have to accept that risk, okay? You have to be comfortable with that. And the patient has to understand the limitation of that as well. The staff member is uh, really just your lay person who is at the front desk to greet the patient, registers them, provides instructions to them, uh, uh, collects the co-pays, any fees that you have. Um, so your staff member at the front desk is really just that. They're the they're the ones that, that uh, greet the patient and then uh, release the patient at the end. The technician, the on-site technician is the one who runs the instruments, submits the data, et cetera, et cetera. The remote technician, which is not listed here, the remote technician is the one who typically will do the um, refraction. Now, depending on the training of the on-site technician, 
you may not necessarily have to have a remote refractionist or a remote technician to perform the refraction. If your on-site technician has the ability to do that, they would simply do it for you. Uh, then you have the remote provider and the remote provider again reviews the data and the images and completes the refraction of the prescription. Now, when I say completes the refraction, essentially what they're doing is they are reviewing it to, for it, uh, whether or not it makes sense. Um, and then they finalize it by signing it. They interact or counsel the patient, they provide the referral, and then of course, ultimately, they're the ones that have to document the care by signing their name at the end of the encounter. Uh, challenges with uh, comprehensive eye care for, uh, with a remote provider is it, it takes time to synchronize everything and have it run um, efficiently and effectively. It's highly, highly reliant on connectivity, as you might imagine. If you're wanting to review slit lamp images, um, and you have slow connectivity, that's going to be challenging to review those video images while your technician is doing it. Uh, and then, of course, the on-site staff is crucial, and um, you're, you're going to pay. You're going to pay to get a certified ophthalmic technician to come in and do those things. You're not going to pay them $12 an hour. You're not going to pay them $15 an hour. You're going to need to be willing to pay them what they're worth to administer that care. So it needs to make sense, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about kind of the emphasis of, of this lab and next, and that's really the virtual at-home visit. And we're gonna go through this in a, in a kind of a sequence of or flow as to how that might work or look um, so that you can start to kind of visualize this process in your head so that when you get out, if you don't already have um, a telemedicine capability in the practice that you join, then you could perhaps use the slide deck to help you get started at least. So when we talk about um, the virtual at-home visit, uh, it starts with your staff, right? It starts with your staff. Um, the staff have to be able to provide certain things or elements to your patients um, because if you're required to do it, it just doesn't make sense. It, 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 the, the chair time and the chair cost involved, if you personally are setting all these up, makes no sense. So we have to make sure that the staff have a playbook that they can work through to facilitate you actually spending the time you need to spend with the patient and not on all of these administrative support tasks. So your staff, before the visit, need to provide the patient with the time, the date and time of their telemedicine visit, and they also need to provide them with the link that they need to follow to join the telemedicine visit. They need to, of course, get the insurance information from the patient. And then they, this is super important, they need to tell the, the patient what to do if the connection is lost. Like, are we gonna call the patient back via that same link or is the patient supposed to call us back on that same link, right? So they need to be able to tell the patient what to do in the case the connectivity is lost. Um, they'll outline the visit uh, flow to the patient so the patient knows what to expect. Okay, Mrs. Jones, you're going to enter the waiting room. Uh, Dr. Hefner, once he joins the meeting, we'll let you in and then we'll verify some information. We'll start the visit, right? So they need to have a concept of about how this is going to work um, and, and then um, so that they can prepare accordingly. Uh, they need to make sure, the staff need to make sure that if there's certain apps that you need the patient to have, or certain software that the patient needs to have in order to successfully accomplish the telemedicine visit, that they, that they share that with the patient, they help them get it set up on their end, so that when you let that patient into the exam room from the waiting room, the patient has all of the, all of the stuff they need to execute your encounter. And then of course, they need to ensure that necessary documents are completed so that things run smoothly. Now, from the perspective of the patient, the patient needs to actually follow the directions of the staff. They need to download the software or the applications that they need. They need to know, uh, they need to know how to access um, and download those things. And, and that's working with your staff to do that. They should complete their personal ocular and personal uh, medical history. Uh, they should jot those things down and have them right there with them when they, when they start the encounter. Things like, um, in addition, they should know their medications and dosages. They should have those elements right there with them so that when you begin your telemedicine visit with your patient, 
they're not searching all over the place trying to pull things together. Uh, they should have any photos available, um, or even better still, if they could send it to you ahead of time via the secure portal in your electronic health record, that's even better so you could review it before you see them. But if not, if they have pictures from when it first started, whatever it is, and they could show that, that's wonderful because then you are able to say, oh, okay, that's what it used to be uh, seven days ago, and this is what it is now. And then the other thing I would say is it's always helpful if they can have someone there with them to assist in the visit, because there are certain things, and you'll find when we do our telemedicine encounter that like, for example, when you're doing your visual acuity and you have to measure your 14 inches, if you had a patient whose dexterity wasn't very good, that could be challenging. So I always incur patient, uh, encourage, excuse me, I always encourage patients to have, uh, have someone in the room with them to help if need be. The doctors, okay, so this is you guys. So you need to make sure you understand how to assess visual acuity, extraocular motility, pupils, um, anterior segment at least, um, and that you've reviewed previous information or data on this patient. That way, when you walk in to the virtual exam room, you, you already have a sense of who your patient is, what they've been through, any contributing history that they may have, um, so that you are able to take more effective care of that patient. All right, so now we've gotten through the, the pre-visit stuff. Now let's get to the visit. Now, I, during the visit, the very first thing you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to obtain consent from the patient to the telemedicine encounter. You need to ensure that you make mention of the limited scope of this encounter and that the telemedicine encounter um, is, is a, continuum, it's a part of the continuum in their healthcare. Um, if you cannot adequately assess or diagnose that they may still have to come in. Okay, so you need to go through and provide them that, uh, that background in the beginning and obtain consent to a telemedicine encounter. Uh, describe your prescribing policy. Um, if you can prescribe or not prescribe medications for that patient or a prescription uh, for glasses for that patient, then of course you're going to need to ensure that they know that at the very beginning. It's all about setting. It's all about setting reasonable expectations. Uh, the patient needs to be seated in a well lit room, um, so we don't want them sitting in a, in kind of a dark cubby hole in their in their house. They need to have a well lit area so you can really see their face and their eyes in particular while you're working with them. Uh, the patient again should have somebody there to help them, and it's always beneficial if they can have headphones on. It does make it easier for them to hear your instructions clearly. Documenting the visit. So as, you, as you've gone through your visit, we also need to make sure we're documenting the, uh, the encounter correctly. So you have to document consent. You have to document the patient and the doctor locations. Uh, were you in your office? Were you at home? Was the patient at home? Were they in a long-term care facility? Where were they at, right? Um, they, you need to uh, document the start and stop time of the encounter. So when you start, just look on your computer screen and, and document what time you began. And then when the patient logs off, you go ahead and document what time the patient logged off. Uh, make sure you uh, record your findings as if the patient were in your exam room to the best of your ability. So any visualizations you've got of the interior segment or the, uh, the orbiter adnexa, plans, assessment plans, test results, consultations, records that you had to review uh, to arrive at your assessment and plan for that patient. Um, it's, it's all encompassing, okay? Think of it as it's no different than if the patient were in your office, the requirements are still the same, okay? The requirements are still the same. It's just that you're accepting greater risk because you aren't going to necessarily have all of the same data that you would be able to gather if the patient were sitting across from you. Digital assessment methods, um, really we're gonna focus just on one. There's a number available, but this is one that I find to be incredibly useful. It has so many different tools with it. Um, plus it has just an amazing repository or database of different diseases and refreshers. So the iHandbook is my recommended, uh, my recommended, my recommended source for you all. Um, it, on the uh, visual acuity, you have a couple of different ways to assess it. Um, you have the pediatric optotypes, and then you have the smell and visual acuity. Um, with this particular assessment of visual acuity, it's done at 14 inches. 
and it's done on the remote device. So once they've downloaded it on their remote device, their, their phone, um, then they'll just simply open up, uh, open up the iHandbook when we begin the encounter, and then you'll guide them through. It also has the ability to check color vision. So if you're concerned that perhaps they've got an optic neuritis um, and, and you're concerned that perhaps that's an issue, you could check color vision real quick. It has a cobalt blue filter. Um, so if you're thinking that there might be uh, a metallic foreign body or something similar or akin to that, you can certainly use the cobalt blue filter. Uh, the pupils, it has the ability to uh, turn the camera light on on your phone and then you can have the patient shine the light in their eye while they're looking in the monitor and you can actually gauge the pupillary reaction and then of course you can do Amsler grid with it and these are just a few things that you can actually assess using the uh, eye handbook so uh, it's a wonderful tool wonderful instrument um, and and this is the thing this is the one app that you will absolutely need to have downloaded before you come to lab this coming week okay so i need you to all have downloaded this either from the app store or google play um, have this on your mobile device so that when we roll into week four lab this this lab this week and we pair you up and we're practicing these things we're not waiting for folks to get the app downloaded okay so please do that then there's old school so if you wanted to uh if you wanted to have your patients uh do a distance visual acuity uh, you could use this. Now, this little guy right here, um, I've given you the hyperlink down here at the bottom, but you'll see that there's a slider right here. The way this works is you just have the patient um, put this on their uh, computer, their computer, their computer screen. And then what they do is they put their credit card up next to the credit card that's on the screen there. And then they enlarge the eye chart and tell the credit card that they have hold, that they're holding next to the blue one on the screen there. When those two credit cards are the same size, that's calibrated for 10 feet. They then back up to 10 feet, cover up one eye, read the smallest line they got, cover up the other eye, the smallest line they got, and boom, you've got distance visual acuity using an old school, new school digital method, okay? And again, this is via secouniversity.com slash acuity. All right, so we, we navigate the visit. How do we bill for the dang thing? Well, here's the deal, folks. With the billing of these visits, um, we've got a couple of different ways to do it. We can do an eye exam code. And, and I know you all are first years, and coding doesn't mean a whole lot to you yet. Uh, but there's two different types of codes, really. Um, it, mainly two different types of codes. There's a, what's considered an eye exam code, and those are typically 92XXX, okay? Um, and it can be 9200. Four, um, that's a comprehensive new patient, or it could be 92014, that's a comprehensive exam existing patient. So you can have 92 codes, which are eye exam codes. You can also have 99XXX codes, and those 99XXX codes are all um, what they call E&M codes. Those are evaluation and management codes. When you go to your physician, for example, your physician uses 99XXX codes. Um, most of the time when you go to the eye doctor, we use a 92XXX code. Um, so when we see a patient for a telemedicine encounter, we could use either one of those. Now, according to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, uh, based on the limitations of technology, we can really only meet the intermediate exam codes, the 92002 or the 92012, because we can't do all of the other elements required or a 92 or a 92004 or a 92014 because those are comprehensive and we just can't meet that. I would concur with the Academy of Ophthalmology sentiment in that we really couldn't nor should we be billing comprehensive eye exams via a telemedicine encounter. Now, the exception, of course, is if you're doing a, uh, a comprehensive encounter in a remote location with uh, a comprehensive encounter. Uh, with a remote located provider, then the argument could be made that yes, you are in fact meeting the wickets of a comprehensive exam. So that's the eye exam codes. The 99,000 codes, the 99XXX, those are the ENM codes. Those are the ones that we would most often use for a telemedicine encounter. Now, having said that, there's also some other very specific to telemedicine codes that we could use. 
The 99421 through 423 are what we call online digital evaluation via secure portals. And that could be um, it, the, what you see out to the right there are time sensitive. Okay, those are time sensitive. So 99421 is if it's 10 minutes or less. Um, 994, 99422 would be uh, up to 20 minutes, and then the two, three would be anything over 21 minutes. That's how that works. Um, and with that, those would be anything that's done via the secure portal in your electronic health record. Then you've got telephonic communication with your patient, and you can see the amount, the average amount paid there. And then you'll also see that the time allocation is roughly the same. So if it's less than 10 minutes, it's the lowest. If it's uh, uh, 11 minutes to 20 minutes, it's going to be in that middle. And then above 21, it goes to the elevator to the higher level. And then they've got the telephonic consult with another qualified healthcare provider. Remember, we used that analogy or that not analogy, but the example earlier where I had a patient in my chair that I thought maybe had an acanth amoeba infection of the cornea. And so I just dialed them in and he took a look at it via Zoom with me. Uh, that would be really considered a telephonic consult with another qualified healthcare provider. Okay, so he's dialing in and checking with me. And then you've got virtual check-in and then the, what we called the store and forward capability, which is the G2010. The virtual check-in is me calling in, uh, checking in on a patient to make sure that there's been no change. Uh, in terms of, of billing based on time, um, on my previous slide here, you'll notice that the synchronous e &M codes I put here um, can either be done, you can code the level according to the uh, complexity of the medical decision making, or you can code it according to the amount of time you've spent with the patient. Now, here at the university, we will not, let me, re let me repeat this, we will typically not be using, using time-based, um, the time-based criteria because um, at the university, it has to be the, the rendering physician. So in other words, if we had you as the students performing the encounter and we only bopped in for the last five minutes of it, we would have to be billing at the lowest possible level. Even though you spent over an hour with the patient, we would have to bill at the lowest level. So therefore, we will typically be using at the university the level uh, the complexity of medical decision making. So. Uh, that's way more than what you need to know, but there are two different ways you could code these visits, uh, these 99,000 series visits, um, and the time based is one of them. Um, a description of these each is uh, out here to the side, problem focused, expanded, detailed, comprehensive, and comprehensive. And I will tell you when we get down to the 9205 uh, and the 9205, um, 992.0. 99205 and the 99215, those are typically referrals, okay? And then down at the bottom here, you'll see uh, the difference between a new and established patient is that it's either a zero in the fourth spot or it's a one in the fourth spot, and that's consistent across the board. Um, when it comes to the medical decision-making, I've given you uh, some examples here. When we get into second year and I get an opportunity to speak with you in the spring of your second year, we will be going um, over this in more detail, uh, but I only give this to you at this point in time, just so you can start to kind of digest some of it. I'm not going to hold you responsible on the lab final proficiency for knowing any of the billing and coding associated with telehealth um, in general um, or uh, telemedicine specifically. So please take these, these billing and coding slides as just for your information at this point in your career. Um, and then down here, I've given you some examples of, of what, what is a problem-focused visit. Um, and a problem-focused visit would be a 10-year-old uh, that needs visual acuity check for a physical. So they're coming in and they just need to finish their before the school year starts physical and they need a visual acuity check. That's typically something that your, your uh, uh, technician can do for you. You don't even have to be involved in that. The 99202 uh, or 212, this is something a little teeny bit more complex, and it would be something like the person needs visual acuity and color vision for a physical. So you may or may not be involved in it. Uh, pretty straightforward decision making, not a big deal. Uh, 13, uh, a 99203 or 13 is going to be if you have a new patient with a chronic 
uh, chronic blepharitis and the history of medication use for it, or you've got an existing patient with primary open ankle glaucoma that's back for a pro, uh, IOP check and medication adjustment. Um, and then, of course, the 99204 or 14 is uh, an existing patient with a sudden onset of flashes of floaters due to a PVD. I want to point out here, if it's an existing patient, okay, if it's an established or an existing patient, that would be a 99214, and 99204 is going to be a new patient. And then let's say, for example, our very last one here, 99205, uh, we've got a 70-year-old new patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, visual field loss, advanced optic nerve cupping, neovascularization of the disc. Uh, we've got basically a freight train. This is somebody that's getting referred right away. Now, again, all of these billing and codings, with the exception of the, the uh, online digital evaluation, the telephonic communication, the telephonic console, the virtual check-in, and the review images store and forward, all of the codes we've talked about, with the exception of that group, apply across the board. So if you've got a 99 or a 92, those will apply across the board. All right. Now that brings us to the recorded encounter. Uh, Jesse and I took an opportunity yesterday. Um, we did a telehealth encounter. Now, when you watch the video, unfortunately, I didn't realize this at the time, but the uh, camera will stay focused on the last individual that made noise. So um, for example, when I'm doing EOMs and I'm having Jesse follow my, uh, my butterfly that's making noise, it's actually focused on me, not on her following it. Likewise, when I'm having her shine the light in her pupils to gauge pupillary reaction, um, you actually are seeing me and not her. And so there are some of those oddities as we work through this. So I, I do apologize for that, but please watch the video, okay? Watch the video all the way through to get an idea of what that flow looks like, okay? Now, as you're watching the video, what I'd also encourage you to do is go ahead and have the telemedicine rubrics beside you. And that telemedicine rubrics can be found under lab five, and it will say telemedicine rubrics. Just have it laid down beside you so that you can really start to put together, okay, this is, this is how I'm going to be evaluated. Uh, this is, these are the things they're looking for. And, uh, and if you have questions, make sure that you, on this coming week, you ask me those questions or the TAs uh, those questions. Um, the other thing that unfortunately didn't show up um, is at the point where I asked Grace, who's my patient, to lean into the camera so I could see her eyes, that's where um, Jesse held up the picture, okay? So Grace, can, she basically filled my entire screen. And this picture that you have here is what you would have seen if, the, if Zoom had worked correctly. She would have held up the picture. You would have seen the whole darn thing. And um, it would have looked just like this. So I apologize for some of those, um, uh, some of those um, glitches, if you will. Um, it's our first time trying to get this uh, into your hands. Oh, and by the way, this is the hyperlink to the video in the box folder. Um, there's also the video is posted in the lab for Moodle for you. So you can actually just watch the video there as well, okay. Um, here's how to document on the telemedicine worksheet. So during lab five, you'll be using a telemedicine worksheet, and then you'll also be completing um, certain areas of the charting in EPIC. You'll be doing putting the visual acuity in there, you'll be putting the EOMs in there, you'll be putting the pupils in there, and then your anterior segment evaluation or observations. You'll be putting those four elements in the EPIC chart. Um, but on the telemedicine worksheet, you'll be responsible for all of these elements that you see listed here, okay? The screenshot right out of EPIC, so when you enter your information or data into EPIC, um, it will, when you enter it into EPIC, it doesn't look like this, all right? It, it's, it's the data entry piece, um, but in order to print it out, if you want it to look like this, okay? So this is the completed encounter for Grace. She had 20-30 visual acuity. She had pupils that were equal round and reactive to light with no APD. She had extraocular motilities that were full. And then she's got her slit lamp evaluation down here. Now, once I was done with that, okay, once I was done entering all that data in, 
all I did was click the eye exam icon, right? So right there in that area, there's that little eye exam icon. You click that and it gives you this eye exam summary of the information that you just put in. So what you'll do is you'll enter in your findings. You'll click that eye exam icon. It'll change your view to this. And then you'll go ahead and capture a screenshot of that. And that's actually what you would turn in or submit for lab five. Okay. All right. Now, what do we got this week? This week, uh, my, my asks, you have nothing to turn in this week, but my asks are that you review the video um, of the telemedicine encounter between Jesse and I, uh, that you watch this lecture. And then on uh, your appointed date, that you appointed uh, your normally scheduled lab time, that you go ahead and zoom in. So you, you go to the Zoom link, zoom in, okay? And then at that stage in the game, what's gonna end up happening is we'll, we'll, we will randomly assign you uh, a partner, and then you will perform a telemedicine encounter on your partner. You'll use the eye handbook, you'll check visual acuities, you'll do pupils, you'll do all the things you need to do. And the key is we want you to really start to work through the process and begin to understand that a little bit. As always, you have your two exams that you need to do on your patient, on uh, two slit lamp exams for the coming week. Um, and then of course you'll turn those in. Uh, when you submit things this week, we don't have any lab assignment you have to turn in. So there won't be any submissions into that folder, but you will still have your weekly lab, your uh, weekly uh, slit lamps. And that is gonna be week four, last name, first name, and then on and on, okay? So, all right, everybody. Thank you very much for bearing with me. I apologize if you got a, a lot of background noise and white courtesy phone pages. Um, fortunately, it looks like I, uh, my flight is still on time and I'm gonna make it. So I can't wait to see y'all next week. I really appreciate everything that you do and, and really your grit for hanging in there. So my best to all of you and I'll see you again soon. Take care. <laughs>